He has never tasted success, never lived anything but a hole and corner existence. But what a wealth of friends he has made. What joyous paintings he has produced and will undoubtedly go on producing until the end of his days. Today, after 30 or more years of black struggle, he has made his home in a poor suburb of Paris. He lives in a miserable shack without heat or any facilities worth mentioning. When he wants to go to Paris, he has to walk to the metro station at the city limits, a distance of some miles. Nothing can defeat him. He remains ever gracious, serene, magnanimous, a truly royal personage. The celebrated biographies give us the sufferings and hardships of the great, but the sufferings and hardships of the unknown are often more eloquent. The tribulations of fate weave a mantle of unsuspected heroism about these lesser figures. To win through by sheer force of genius is one thing. To survive and continue to create when every last door is slammed in one's face is another. Nobody acquires genius, it is God-given, but one can acquire patience, fortitude, wisdom, understanding. Perhaps the greatest gift the little men have to offer us is this ability to accept the conditions which life imposes, accept one's own limitations, in other words. Or to put it another way, to love what one does, whether it causes a stir or not. Of the highest men, Vivekananda once said, they make no stir in the world. They are calm, silent, unknown. And now let me return to the greenhouse in Beverly Glen, where I made so many watercolors, sold them for a song or for an umbrella I had no use for, but where I also made and found friends I never knew existed. Who knows what is good for man in this life? Poverty is one of the misfortunes people seem to dread even more than sickness. Bernard Shaw was positively frightened of it. But is it so dreadful? For me, this seemingly bleak period was a most instructive one because, not being able to write for money, I had to turn to something else to keep going. It could have been shining shoes. It happened to be watercolors. To make watercolors for money never gave me the least qualm. I set no price on my labors. Whatever the buyer chose to offer, whatever he thought he could afford, no matter how ridiculous the sum, I said, yes. I did what I could, and the buyer had to accept it in good faith. Now and then, if he insisted that I make him a landscape, a nude, a head, I would endeavor to comply. If it turned out to be a failure, it was his hard luck. No shame, no guilt involved. Abi gesund, I'd say to myself, meaning so long as you're healthy. Catering to my clients in my own sweet way was quite different, it seemed to me, from accepting a handsome advance of a commercial publisher and getting tied up in knots, struggling to produce the pap which they expect. I could have had a good paying job in the film industry. It wasn't that I despised the handsome salary that was offered. I simply couldn't pretend to kill time, which was part of the bargain. To be sure, making watercolors was also a way of killing time, but it involved no temptations. I earned just enough to keep my head above water. It was like writing songs and getting paid to whistle them. They went fast, my little jobs. Some must have been absolutely frightful, no question about it. Even Vincent Price, generous and indulgent as he then was, balked at some I offered him. On the whole, you might say that a happy atmosphere prevailed. Never anything comparable to that shameful state of slavery to which Modigliani was reduced by his rapacious dealer. While turning them out, I had my friend John Dudley to talk to. Young as he was, he was already a disaffiliated artist. If I couldn't make a bird or fish the right way, 
I would ask him to show me how. Taking a tiny piece of paper, always the tiniest, he would then draw me a bird, fish, a zebra, whatever was called for. Though I had given him carte blanche, he would never touch the painting I was engaged on. If I were puzzled about color combinations, he would amble over to my table, take one look, and in a quiet, authoritative way say, try a dash of cobalt blue, or give it a touch of moss green. He would then go back to the divan, on which he spent a lot of time, often doing nothing more than trimming his locks, and continue his divagations on Rambeau. He was fascinated by Rambeau because, like the incredible Rambeau himself, he too had walked out on his chosen vocation. Morning, noon, and night, he had the gramophone going. Nothing but jazz. Sometimes he would deliver a monologue on the subject. It might last an hour or two. Louis Armstrong figured heavily in these flights. So did Herman Melville and Siqueiros, the wild Mexican painter. It might be three in the morning with everyone peacefully tucked away in that quiet, stilly glen and Dudley and I still chirping away about Louis the Armstrong, Siquilianos, Moby Dick, the wilds of Abyssinia, the magic of Hölderlin, or the capture of Fort Ticonderoga. It was during such bouts that I would take it into my head to insert a line from Rambeau in one of my watercolors, or something from Baudelaire, such as, Il est défendu à l'homme de déranger son destin. There was always enough to eat and drink, no rent to worry about, thanks to our generous hosts, and our legs strong enough to take us to Westwood Village and back when we needed supplies. Once we bought a car for $35, used it a day or two, then ditched it. It was tough walking at two or three in the morning from the remote heights of Hollywood, but then there was no time clock to punch, and whether I got up at noon next day or 5 p.m. was all one. The greenhouse was a snug, cozy place, more like an aquarium than a guest house. Visitors came and went at all hours. Once the Los Angeles chief of police drove up in a limousine to present the director of some famous art museum. Knut Merrill, the Danish painter, used to come regularly, always with fresh reminiscences of his days with D.H. Lawrence in New Mexico. Now and then I visited Man Ray in his Hollywood studio. Wonderful evenings, which always began and ended with the Marquis de Sade. One day I decided to make a little greenhouse just big enough for a dwarf or a cretin, and in it I placed a black nude with rubber arms and legs standing on a miniature Persian rug. It is now in the possession of Geraldine Fitzgerald, one of the more fascinating visitors to the greenhouse. I saw it a couple of years ago when visiting Geraldine in New York, and I must say it didn't look near as goofy as I thought when I painted it. There was a nice cool green wind blowing through it. Of course, all this good fortune of being able to work like a dog in happy poverty was the result of a chance encounter with Artilio Bowinkle who ran an art shop in Westwood Village. One day I entered his shop to buy two tubes of paint. I asked for the cheapest watercolors he had. When he asked me if that was all I needed, I told him frankly that that was all I could afford at the moment. Whereupon the good Mr. Bowinkle put me a few discreet but pertinent queries. I answered briefly and truthfully. Then he said, and I shall never forget it, Choose what you like, paper, paints, brushes, whatever you need. It's a gift. A few days later, he came to the greenhouse to inspect my work. I blushed when I showed him what I had on hand. He didn't say whether they were good or bad, but on leaving, he took a few with him, and the next day, on passing his shop, I noticed two of them in the window, beautifully framed. They were sold that very day to Arthur Freed of MGM, a collector of modern European paintings. 
Thereby hangs another tale, but this is not the place to go into it. It is the place, however, to repeat what I have said elsewhere, that in Attilio Bowinkle I found a friend and a savior. And so, though I come to him last, I trust he will forgive me, for often the first are last and the last first.